Next, we will have Michael DeRoma. He's the director and in-house counsel of QGA Public Affairs. Michael spent nearly four years working as a research associate for the Cambridge, Massachusetts-based Committee on Capital Markets Regulation, where he performed legal, financial, and tax policy research, including preparation of congressional testimony on the Dodd-Frank Act implementation. Michael has also worked in the White House Counsel's Office during the Bush administration. Uh, Michael will talk about another issue that comes up in the consumption tax discussion is how do you get from here to there? How do you transition from what we have to whatever a something else is when we, if and when we incorporate a consumption tax into uh, our system in some way offsetting certain things that we think are appropriate for uh, the national interest. So what Michael has done and will talk about is we, obviously this is not, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Over 150 countries have done this before. So can we avoid mistakes and the like? So Michael will present three case studies he's looked into of three uh, countries who have done it. And uh, we we'll look forward to hearing it. So I guess now we can kind of get into the how. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. It's great to be here to talk about value by the tax. This is one of those things I studied for what's called an LR degree over at Georgetown in, in taxation. And, and so it's kind of fun to be able to present uh, a little bit about uh, our research. Um, the value by the tax is definitely not something that's on a lot of people's minds uh, right now because it sounds scary and, and European. But I think at the end of the day, it's a pretty simple concept. And it's certainly much more effective than our current message state taxes that we have right now. Um, I don't want to get too distracted right now by thinking about how we might kind of get this to work here at home. In fact, I'm, I'm here to discuss how three of America's allies have implemented their own consumption tax regimes. So I want to look at Australia, Canada, and India, which each have a federal system of government like ours, and uh, kind of take a look at how each took a different approach to, to uh, implementing a national value by the tax. And I want to emphasize national as opposed to the subnational, which I'll be doing quite a bit here as we talk about each country. Um, so today I'd like to cover the motivations for the VAT, its organization, and its administration in each of these countries as a way of kind of exploring what we might do here in the U.S. And I think Australia is a pretty good place to start because it's easy, it's straightforward. They pursued what we call an aggressive approach to nationalizing their consumption tax, mostly because long ago they had, uh, the, the states had kind of taken a secondary role in consumption taxes, in, in fact in taxation in general. So it wasn't the states that needed to, be convinced, needed to be convinced, it was the citizens themselves. It was a very doubtful public, like we're obviously going to have here as soon as, the, uh, as soon as the public catches when this might be something we try in Washington. Um, and, and so that's why I think this is our greatest lesson that we can take from, from Australia. It's very simple. Um, it's, it's, it has to be a, a very good and, and well-implemented public relations strategy. It's not the only thing we need to do, but, but this is something that other countries have done poorly, and it's something that most of the time we're pretty good at here, but we need to make sure we focus on. Australia approached the introduction of that as an exercise in garnering popular support to take their national action. And I think that it's likely the resulting very simple nationwide rate of 10% and a very wide tax base, although not completely, uh, uh, it's, it's not a situation where you're taxing everything because in any situation we're going to have to exempt some goods, we, we have to exempt food or it will be a regressive tax. Um, and, and I think it's so simple because of the need that they had to sell it to the public the way they did. Um, and like the tax itself in Australia, the history of the Australian VAT is pretty simple too, and I just want to go through it real quick. By the end of the 20th century, Australia was in dire need of a more modern tax system, which, whether it looks like it or not, we are in need of the same thing here in terms of how we tax in the states, uh, at the state level of the consumption tax regimes. Australia needed a system that would bring about uh, both greater administrative ease and an increase in revenue. But there were strong internal political forces at work on both sides of the uh, VAT question. And as early as 1975, government bureaucrats were already concluding that the VAT would be a good option, obviously, for the nation because of its simplicity and efficiency, but bad because of its unfair treatment of the poor, its regressivity. Uh, the task for the government then was to find an approach that would be fair for all taxpayers and yet not difficult to administer. And so for, for about 20 years, until the mid-90s, politicians debated and enacted various kinds of taxes with different rates and different bases. And then even in 1996, the Prime Minister was afraid to publicly acknowledge the likelihood of the new tax. They, they knew 
And I, and I kind of been comparing it to Obamacare recently. You know, we knew that our healthcare system was broken. Uh, and we knew we needed to fix it. And so it, 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 at some point, it, I think it just takes the government saying, we're going to do this. And, and that's what was going on in the mid-90s with uh, the, the tax situation on Australia. We're going to do this. And, and so uh, while the government, as I said, could be aggressive with the states, it also had to be to the public's concern over a new tax system. Um, Prime Minister Howard made the would-be in goods and services tax, as they call it, the central plank in the parliamentary elections of 98. This government sought to package its complex tax reform plan in a simple, aspirational, and a kind of ambiguous efficiency idea. It asked voters to see the national interest ahead of personal doubts and fears. And so the Howard government secured what is all but necessary, we all know this, for something this big, and will certainly be necessary here, and that is a clear mandate for tax reform from the voters. Indeed, the government's victory paved the way for a legitimate debate in Parliament, and lawmakers held out for concessions, finally, that would mitigate those regressive consequences. And so that despite this very wide base, it's not that we're not taxing everything again. And in the interest of fairness, the Australian VAT, as I said, known as the GST, ultimately exempted certain goods like food and, and medicine from the tax altogether. And so at the state level, the key to Australia's strategy rested on the federal government's historical supremacy, as I mentioned, over state taxing authority. During World War II, the federal government had physically seized state tax offices in order to collect revenue for the war. The policy from that era conditioned federal money on states' agreements not to impose taxes. And more importantly, the federal constitution in Australia significantly limited the taxing authority uh, of state and local governments. So it was, it was pretty easy for Australia, much more easy than it's going to be here, and certainly easier than it was in Canada and India. So given the aggressive takeover of taxation by the feds in the 40s, states now rely on the government to fund a significant portion of their annual budgets. Their reliance on the federal government led state leaders to cooperate pretty well when, when the time came. Not an issue. Um, administratively, over in Australia, the, the introduction of the GST allowed for a significant modernization of the tax system, so businesses operate with identification numbers. They, they file statements declaring how much GST they owe, and they can do it all online. Uh, Australia's GST is destination-based, as we mentioned earlier, a very important situation for trade, which means a good is taxed on the receiver's jurisdiction. And while this makes a little difference between, uh, for, for sales between businesses in Australia, between the states, it is significant, obviously, in terms of international transactions. So, a, a deep dive for a second. For, foreign companies must register for GST just like domestic companies to report and pay the GST on the supplies sales they make in Australia. Anything shipped out of Australia is GST free. And the application of this destination principle allows Australia to make, of course, competitive uh, internationally. And so perhaps owing to its status as one of the latest countries to adopt the VAT, and Australia has a fairly simple consumption tax structure, especially for a federal system. It's, it's going to get more complex in a second with Canada. Uh, the GST's base, as I said, is very wide, and the taxable supply in Australia includes not only the sale of goods or supply of services, but it also includes things like uh, giving advice, like professional legal advice, and, and even leasing or selling property rights. Uh, however, as I mentioned, in order to make up for this regressive tendency, there are some exemptions, and, and as I said, the list goes, goes fairly long um, for, for what their goal was, and I think for countries like uh, New Zealand, which, which doesn't exempt much. Certain beverages, many medicines, just to name a few. And so by comparison to what we face in the US and what Canada has faced over the years, I, I think Australians, as I said, have, have, have had it pretty easy. Canada doesn't have many provinces on the other hand, certainly nothing close to our 50 states. But I think their approach is more useful to us than, than it might seem uh, uh, at the onset. They've pursued what we've called a piecemeal strategy. They've implemented a coordinated VAT system using voluntary agreements on a province-by-province -province basis, often with quite different terms for each. And so maybe as I, as I go through this, we can kind of think about what's happening, what would happen in the United States on a, something like this, a voluntary system, where we're asking each of the 50 states to sign on to what the federal government um, is proposing. Um, and just contemplate how much, how, how long that might actually take. The idea of that implementation didn't arise in a vacuum in Canada. They needed to raise revenue to close a major budget deficit, which was at the time almost 8% of GDP. And in addition, there was a federal sales tax in place, but it was hopelessly inefficient and administratively not so easy. Uh, and, 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 and it wasn't even very helpful to the economy. And that falls in line with, with their third motivation, which was kind of holistically to make things much simpler. So Canada's VAT system, as we know it today, came about with the enactment of the National Goods and Services Tax, also called the GST, which is what you're going to find in a lot of English-speaking countries, uh, meaning that every transaction taking place in the country would now result in a federal tax payment. Every transaction, no matter what the states were doing. And I think that's something we often lose sight for 
we talked about it here in the United States, if we get rid of the income tax and we just have a 12 or 20 or 25 percent you know, consumption tax at the national level, as, as far as things go now, since states kind of have the jurisdiction over consumption taxes right now, uh, that's going to be in addition to whatever we're paying at the state and local levels. Always something that it's easy to lose sight of at, at, at this point in the debate, I think. But conservatives pushed uh, the GST through Parliament, which went into effect in 91, despite, despite massive public opposition and a provincial lawsuit, which the federal government won on constitutional issues. But the Canadian experience confirmed every politician's fear that supporting a VAT is career suicide. It was a bloodbath. At the time, it was called the most dramatic collapse ever of a political party in a stable democratic country. The conservative party that had ushered in the VAT was virtually eliminated from Parliament in the next election. The party fell from a historic majority, numbering in the hundreds when they passed the VAT, uh, to a mere two seats in the House of Commons in, in 1993. Uh, this, it's, it, was, it was awful. Despite the political turmoil, the Canadian experience was a success, though. The, the VAT is still there. Uh, and but for British Columbia, we have a pretty successful situation up there. It demonstrated that it is possible to coordinate a national VAT with a variety of subnational uh, consumption taxes on a voluntary basis. The federal government took the position that provinces could maintain their own sales taxes and make no changes in response to the adoption of the national VAT. And so this is exactly what most of the provinces did initially. It took quite a while. Over time, however, they concluded that it would be best to follow a policy of harmonization. And with the exception of Quebec, which of course is, is uh, kind of consist consistently doing its own thing in, in every possible way. Uh, indeed, in 1993, with conservatives vanquished, the newly elected Liberal government shifted its approach by launching an effort to encourage provinces to voluntarily harmonize these taxes with the GST. And four years later, we had three smaller provinces join in. Nova Scotia and Brunswick and Newfoundland replaced their retail sales taxes with harmonized VATs. They called this new combined tax the Harmonized Sales Tax, or HST, and left it up to the federal government to administer. So states kind of let their bureaucrats go. They, they, the, the tax collectors changed over to, to be, become federal employees if they wanted to, and the states were out of the, the consumption tax collection game. For over a decade, the HST network remained pretty small and it expanded significantly with the additions of, of British Columbia and Ontario. And I'll mention in a moment what happened with British Columbia very recently. It's, it's kind of a sad situation uh, in the tax world. Both provinces replaced their previous provincial taxes with harmonized sales taxes in 2010, although BC was recent, has recently reversed course. This sort of voluntary approach now has avoided any more constitutional challenges like we had initially. But there are still holdouts. Manitoba and Saskatchewan, now again in BC, continue to administer their own taxes, while Alberta and three northern territories have no consumption taxes at all. So it's working, where we have a different situation in each state. Compare that again to Australia, where we have no consumption taxes at the state level. It's just a national tax, and they're funneling money back into the states. So there's nothing much to worry about there. I have a, I have a suspicion that would never happen here, again, just because we kind of left it up to the states for so long, since the 30s. Now, there's an important practical question to be asked here. How do these different systems interact in terms of uh, business registration requirements and interprovincial sales? Within the harmonized network, registration requirements for the national tax and provincial sales are, provincial taxes are essentially the same. Quebec, of course, operates its own registration system, but it, it is actually coordinated with the national tax registration pretty well. Um, as for interprovincial sales, all of the taxes, but the holdover provincial retail sales taxes, and remember, obviously, we're all aware of the RST, PAT difference in terms of how the taxes actually work. So it is a big deal to have to overlay a, a VAT and a GST with, with uh, retail sales taxes because there's a different tax base and there's different rates and, and each local jurisdiction has its own tax rates and basis. So it does get complicated um, in, those, in those provinces that have left uh, the retail sales taxes. Uh, the rules get kind of tricky and so I won't get into them here, but suffice it to say, uh, I think harmonization is working because Canadians are, are simply cooperating now with each other. And, and that's what it's going to take here in the U.S. as well. Provinces agree to essentially essential uniformity of tax bases as a condition of joining the harmonized network. And although Quebec sets its own base independently, the bases have been narrowing over time and now are essentially the same. So even if it is achieved on a voluntary basis, a uniform tax base is critical, as I said, to effectively implementing such a harmonized approach. Uh, by this, I mean if each province defines its own tax base, compliance with the harmonized tax would become significantly more complicated become nearly impossible for just one level of government to be collecting a tax. As I said, in, in those harmonized provinces, it's the federal government that's collecting all the tax, and the provinces have kind of gone, gone away in terms of their tax bureaus. 
And so because the tax base is uniform, the provincial rates are essentially treated as a surcharge where they kind of piggyback on the federal goods and services tax. And therefore, the harmonized tax and the Quebec's tax rates are commonly expressed as a combination of the federal and provincial, provincial portions. So the federal government sets a uniform rate, which right now is 5%, and then each provincial government sets its own VAT rate, which usually falls between 5 and 10. And as we know, in Canada, you know, this is typically expressed as just one single rate, 15%, for example. And, and so, for example, if I walk into a grocery store in Nova Scotia and I buy a candy bar for a dollar, I pay 15% tax on the sale. I'm not concerned where this 15% goes. I'm just paying it. And, and since Nova Scotia is, is in the harmonized network, the store remits the 15 cents to the federal government, which then pays 10 cents um, over to Nova Scotians and obviously keeps the 5 cents for itself. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's one sad story to report here. British Columbia, following the referendum fairly recently, uh, left the harmonized network and they've literally returned to their previous provincial tax. The reversal is a result of widespread confusion over the implications of the, of the, the harmonized tax system, both on the taxpayers and the economy. And it's taking place despite hideous costs of transitioning back to, to the prior system. They have to develop complex transitional rules to go back. They're rewriting provincial tax laws and, and they're rebuilding their capacity to administer the old provincial retail sales tax. They're hiring back their former employees to, to get the tax bureau started again. Um, nevertheless, the harmonized system seems to be working well despite the fact that it has not been uniformly adopted yet in all the states, or in all the provinces. Adding Ontario gave the harmonized network a critical mass, so a majority of Canada's population now operates within it. And indeed, perhaps the greatest lesson I think you know, we can take from Canada is that a federal VAT can coexist with a variety of other subnational consumption taxes, including subordinate VATs, an independent Quebecois VAT, where it's off doing its own thing but still contributing to the system, and then a series of independent retail sales taxes, which in this country are bound to stick around for a while. So if the Canadian experience demonstrates that a variety of these subnational VATs are possible in a federal system, the Indian experience, I think, presents the uh, possibility of a more unified approach to nationwide implementation. So as opposed to piecemeal and voluntary, it's this kind of unified situation. Like the US, India has a robust federal system, 28 states and seven union territories, covering a populous, geographically vast, and a demogra uh, demographically diverse country. They pursue what we call a diplomatic approach of implementing a coordinated national, subnational VAT system through voluntary agreements, an approach more akin an approach more akin to Canada's than Australia's. And unlike Canada's federally, federal, federally driven patchwork system, India's strategy could be called state-driven and comprehensive. So far, the result in India has two parallel VAT systems. And it gets, it gets fairly complicated. I'll run through this uh, somewhat quickly. Right now, they have those two parallel systems, a national VAT and, and a state-level uh, VAT in the territories and all of the states. Um, and as in Canada, India's implementation story began with the enactment of that national VAT. India then took that diplomatic approach of empowering a committee that represented all of the states to design and implement a single subnational VAT. So the Federal Ministry of Finance established what they call this Empowered Committee of State Finance Ministers in 1999 and granted it frontline responsibility for the implementation process. Through the uh, Empowered Committee, the state representatives reached a broad consensus to introduce VAT in all Indian states and territories in 04. So they're, they're literally going in and bringing in these finance ministers in all the states and saying, Basically, you create it. We, we're creating this national VAT. You create a VAT at the state level and find a way to harmonize it. And, and they're really involving the state leaders in the process. And, and obviously, even in this, especially in this country, we think of our state leaders as much closer to the people and, and kind of the, the basic wants and desires um, than we do people, you know, representatives here in Washington. Um, as in Canada, India's approach required the federal government to provide incentives implementation. Uh, it, it reflects three main methods of, of having done so. The federal government compensated the states for any revenue loss on account of that introduction, which is obviously something we're going to have to do here uh, with the phase out over, over several years, and India was three years. India's federal government also provides administrative support, particularly technical and financial support. And finally, India's federal government handled its PR better than Canada, launching a marketing campaign to demonstrate how that would help common people, traders, and industry alike, not just the government. Something we're going to have to do here, obviously, as well. Questions regarding the tax base and rates are uniquely complex in India. The federal government sets its own tax base for SENVAT, the central uh, value added tax at the federal level, and the, and the Empowered Committee imposed the central uniformity of tax bases as a condition to the state tax system. States do not have the power to tax services, while the federal government does not have the power to tax the sale of goods. And this is actually 
constitutional. So it's going to take a constitutional amendment in India to allow the tax bases to be completely harmonized at this point, which still hasn't happened. We, you know, they introduced the amendment to the Constitution in 2011, I believe it was, and we just had elections last week, so we'll see where the government kind of takes things. Um, and, and so that's, you know, the current situation, uh, just to wrap up with India, only represents the halfway point, because the current system has uncoordinated federal state sales taxes, and a variety of older consumption taxes continue to overlap with the VAT. India is still planning this dramatic overhaul, as I said, to create a more integrated parallel system referred to as the dual GST, one levied by the federal government, the other levied by the states. So ultimately, we will have bases that interact well. We will have a situation where goods and services can be taxed widely by both the federal and state government, and then we will be able to harmonize the, the actual collection process. Um, and so I, I just want to come back to the United States for a second. The important question, the threshold question for us, of course, is whether we're even capable of adopting a national debt in the first place. The idea has been around since the Nixon administration, but it's obviously far from popular. In fact, just four years ago, the always cooperative U.S. Senate passed a symbolic resolution with a largely bipartisan majority, randomly expressing opposition to the U.S. debt. randomly. This isn't even something that's actually on the table in, in let's say, Chairman Camp's draft, uh, and, and yet they are randomly making um, their opposition clear. Beyond the incredible political hurdles that exist here in Washington, we also have uniquely independent-minded states and a public rightly afraid, as I said, of European-style taxes. Remember, U.S. states control consumption taxes in this country, as I said. When they, take, when they need a revenue boost, they rely, as Arizona did not too long ago, as lots of states did not too long ago, on their ability to quickly increase those sales tax rates. Or if they want to kind of boost spending, they're able to lower those sales tax rates. An additional federal consumption tax uh, would surely restrict this kind of state flexibility. Furthermore, our states use retail sales taxes, not VATs, and tax bases and rates vary endlessly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Nine or 10,000 jurisdictions, endlessly. Most state sales taxes, for historical reasons, um, because we were a more agrarian economy in the 30s, the 20s and 30s, focus on goods rather than services, which is a problem in our modern uh, service-based economy. But going forward, uh, uh, rather than dwell on the negative, I think we should remember that Canada has demonstrated that retail sales taxes and VATs can coexist. And perhaps a national VAT movement would even be a good time to push states to modernize their own consumption tax regimes. If we can emulate India's inclusive approach and Australia's sensitivity to, to public perception, the possibility, I think, certainly exists for the United States to enact a national debt, while also reforming our old style, uh, our old fashioned state consumption taxes to boot. Um, and that's about all I have here. I want to thank you for your time and, and paying attention to such technical legislative information. <laughs> Thank you, Michael DeRoma.